This is another eye raw podcast. How do you how do you define the city and how do you identify who you consider a resident? So that's that's I think that first right uh, or that first question of who's right is you have to think about who you define as a resident. Welcome back to The Animal Turn, everyone. It's finally season three. Yay! In this season, we're going to be talking all about animals and the urban. Straight away, I just want to say I'm sorry that it's taken me so long to get this season up and running. Uh, In case you haven't noticed, I've been a little bit busy with getting a website launched. Yes, The Animal Turn now has its own dashing website, uh, theanimalturnpodcast.com. You need to go check it out. It's awesome. Uh, I spent many an evening trying to tinker with it and put it together. I found a whole bunch of really cool images, and I think it came together fairly well. If you've got any additional ideas for the uh, for the podcast, for the website, uh, feel free to reach out to me because now there's a contact page. So I'm extremely excited about the website. I wanted to make sure that that was up and available to you before we launched season three. But now that it's done, it's time to get back to the airwaves. And in this season, we're going to be talking all about animals and the urban. What is the urban? What are cities? And why should we be talking or even thinking about animals in these spaces? I find this particularly interesting. Uh, I myself am doing my PhD on animals in urban spaces. You've kind of heard hints and and hints of what I might be doing. Um, And I'm slowly actually starting to figure that out myself. Year three of a PhD and I'm finally saying, oh, maybe this is what I'm doing. So it gives me great pleasure to do this season on animals in the urban. I have some fantastic guests lined up and I think you're going to find it really informative. Now that we've got that kind of bedrock of understanding the relationship between animals and the law and, you know, just always keeping the back of our mind that animals are viewed as property and what this means for the kinds of relationships they can form. And then, of course, in season two, when we started to speak about animals and experience and recognizing that you know animals have experiences and they have distinct experiences and they have experiences both as individuals but as members of groups there are a variety of relationships and experiences out there to understand and in this first episode we're going to raise kind of a baseline question who has a right to the city and I'm going to be speaking to Marie Carmen Shingne, who is a doctoral candidate at Michigan State University with specializations in animal studies and global urban studies. Her dissertation research is focused on the experiences of the slum residents and street dogs in the Indian city of Pune, and what these experiences tell us about power in and access to urban spaces and resources. And we rely a lot on Marie's paper, The More Than Human Right to the City, city a multi-species reevaluation for this. This conversation only starts to scratch the surface. This helps us begin the question, who is a city for? Hi, Marie. Welcome to The Animal Turn. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to have you. I just finished reading your paper this morning. Uh, But before we get into your paper and the concept and focus today, which is rights in the city or right to the city, could you maybe tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, who are you and, and how did you come to, to animal studies? Sure. So um, I kind of have that typical, I always wanted to work with animals story. Um, started pet sitting at 11, um, did a bunch of internships in college with uh, zoos and humane societies, things like that. And when I came out of undergrad, I had a psychology major and didn't really know how to go from psychology to working with animals directly. Um, but I started my master's in animals and public policy. And through that, actually, I uh, met a woman at the International Fund for Animal Welfare who uh, was talking about street dogs or stray dogs in uh, mostly Eastern Europe and was telling me these stories of how people were interacting with them in a very different way than people might in the U.S. with a stray dog. Uh, In the U.S., you might assume that a dog is an owned dog, somebody lost them, you take them to the shelter, 
and you hope that they either get adopted or their owner finds them. And in Eastern Europe, in, um, in Thailand, in India, and in all these other countries, people just are okay with the dogs living out on the street. They'll feed them, they'll interact with them to an extent, but nobody says, oh, this is my dog, or I feel responsible for taking them to the shelter. And that opened mm -hmm. a whole new understanding of how do we interact with different animals in different settings. And specifically, it got me interested in the urban setting because of uh, specifically dogs running freely. But then it opened this whole world of other animals that we don't necessarily even think about being in the urban setting. And I wanted to explore that more, seeing how, how we interact with animals. Because as at least in the Western world, as you grow up, you think of animals either in your home, on a farm, or in the wilderness, you don't think of them as being residents mm -hmm. of a city. Um, so that's, it was a very long um, process of really connecting all of these different dots. And then after my master's, I actually went into more hands-on work because that's, that's where I thought I wanted to be. I worked in shelters for a while, um, but I just kept coming back to this idea of how do we interact with other animals? How do we categorize them? How do we define them? Um, which is what led me to go back to a PhD and then create this whole, I guess, identity around um, animals and specifically urban animals. Do you have a background in um, like urban studies or in geography? Why, you know, why the intense interest in urban animals as opposed to, like you said, wild animals or farm animals? Yeah, so I actually don't, I, like I said, my undergrad was in psychology, my master's was in animals and public policy from Tufts University. So very mm -hmm. focused, um, very social based. And then obviously, my PhD is also in sociology. So I'm very social based. But the for some reason, for me, the urban space is what's interesting, because of our idea of urban equals human. Um, so we we kind of put this barrier up and say urban is human first or human only and then animals either if they're in the urban space they have to be in our homes or otherwise they're outside of the urban space so we think of agriculture being somewhat outside of the urban space although there is now urban agriculture again which complicates it or animals are way out somewhere in the wilderness it's more the social piece of it the social definition and and you know the the human animal divide and how the the city is kind of used to hold up that divide right so like exactly. the city is viewed as a human almost exclusively human place um and the minute you spend even a minute thinking about it you realize that that's just not the case right exactly the city is not a human uh, human place it's definitely more than human mm -hmm. um so in thinking about uh Animals and the urban. So yes, animals are here. Animals are in the city, and we can appreciate that there are you know many many animals here. But why would it be important uh, to understand this from a scholarly perspective? Why why is this a significant area of study? Uh, why should we care? Why don't we just continue building our cities, continue doing what we're doing? Yes, animals are there, but so what? Who cares? Why why is focusing on the urban in particular and animals' relationships with the urban are really important. Yeah, so I, you kind of touched on it. You said, why can't we just keep building our cities? And that's exactly the thing, is that cities, the urban space is growing continuously. It's, it's the fastest growing space, quote unquote, for human beings. So if you think about it, let's see if I get these numbers right in my head now quickly, but um, in, so basically from 1950s, the 1950s, we've been really building up our urban spaces. So in around 1950, 70% or so of people lived in rural spaces. The UN did a report in 2018 where they noted, where they noted that in 2007 was the first time that more humans lived in urban spaces than lived in rural spaces. So we're starting to see this major shift into a very urbanized world. Um, and the estimate from that UN report was that by 2050, um, we basically will have shifted completely 
into the opposite direction. So in 1950, we had 70% in rural spaces. By uh, 2050, we're going to have almost 70% in urban spaces. So you're seeing a huge shift into these urban spaces, which means our population is growing and the urban population is growing, which means these urban spaces have to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and take up much more space. And so we've already Mm -hmm. seen people as they're building their urban spaces, they're going into non-urban spaces to build up that space and they're taking over territory that belonged for lack of a better word to other animals, to other creatures um, before this. And so we have to think about how do we share this world? We can't just take over everything and say, this is ours now. Um, Mm -hmm. We, for one, we need nature. We need to keep nature going Um, however you want to define that, um, to be able to keep the earth functioning. And also there can't, I think there is an argument to be made ethically and morally that we can't just take over everything and call it ours and not think about the other beings that we share this world with. And it's, it's not just, uh, I think, our population dynamics, you know, in, in thinking about cities expanding. So, uh, I mean, what you're saying here, in effect, is that non-urban space is becoming less and less, whereas urban space is becoming more and more. But it's not just the urban, right? It's also spaces outside of the urban that are attached to the urban. So um, food production systems, agriculture, farming, uh, what kind of consumption is happening in the city that is fueling the reduction in, in different kinds of spaces? So you know, I think you've got a proliferation of uh, intensified agricultural land. Mm -hmm. And why is that uh, happening? Well, because the consumption in cities, so not just the number of people, but an individual today consumes far more in the way of food, water, um, electricity, whatever it is, they they tend to consume more uh, than they did previously. And again, this has obviously got something of a uh, a western or a northern city bias here where we're, we're saying you know a consumer in new york or a consumer in toronto uh, may be consuming more than you know several people in a different part of the world uh not always the case but yeah i think it's 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 interesting and the reason i just bring this up because sometimes we think of the urban as being i guess uh isolated from these other spaces that you're talking of like these nature spaces but also agricultural spaces right yeah yeah and even to address the uh, i mean the western that western or um the idea of cities like toronto or new york people using up a lot more energy my research actually right now is very focused on um particularly one indian city pune but I've been very drawn into the Indian context when it comes to the urban space. And one thing that um, I touched on in my paper and I've, I've delved into for my dissertation is this idea of smart cities that they're developing in India, where they're very focused on bringing technology into the city to improve it. I mean, they're making a lot of improvements in terms of speed of transportation. They're trying to build uh, systems of healthcare. They're doing all these really good things. But what really stands out to me is that it very much, it continues this trend of trying to pull the urban away from nature, from animals, from anything like that. So one of the examples that I draw on a lot is, um, I'm going to forget what city it is, but they were building a fast train track in this one city. And they were saying, we have to get rid of all the dogs that live around here because they're going to get in the way, they're going to get hit by a train, they're going to, they're basically going to cause traffic problems. And it, it highlights mm-hmm. how as you're building these cities in across the world, it's not just in Western settings, as you're building them across the world and using technology writ large as your basis for how you build them, other animals, other nature is being erased even more in like in even bigger an even mm-hmm. bigger sense basically so yes on one hand western um western cities and residents in western cities use way more resources in general but we are also seeing we are seeing that trend in a lot of other places as well and so that's 
that's one reason why um, I think it's so important to talk about it now, because we're seeing that happening everywhere at this point. Yeah, and urbanization itself is a, is a process, right? It, it involves, it's not standardized, all cities don't urbanize in the same way, certainly, but to maybe think through how this is tied to other animals' lives, uh, I agree with you, is a really worthwhile um, thing, and not just worthwhile, but I think needed, necessary. Um, uh, something you keep uh, referring to in relation to the urban, so you keep saying the urban and nature, uh, and and I know that this is maybe a failing of of our language to some extent, but is the urban not nature? Is is yes. the urban not also a form of nature? In in yeah, what what do you think yes. of that? So yes, that is. <laughs> yes, I, I'm end actually of story. every end of story pretty much. But I keep <laughs> as I say it every time. I'm like, I need a better word. I need a better word. It's just it's the word mm-hmm. that pops into our head immediately. It's we think of urban and nature. It's this divide, which is actually one of my biggest things if i if if we're talking about like what my what my research is about what my interests are in is this idea of categorizing of always having to have a name for everything of saying okay this this animal fits into this category that animal fits into that category even people we do it with people um we have to define them by their religion their race anything anything to put every everyone and everything that we interact with into a box. So yes, I'm, I keep mm-hmm. saying nature and I'm like, I have to think, I, I know there's better terms for it and I know there's, there's better ways to identify it. But I, I mean, I, I come back to it all the time. I, I make that mistake myself all the time as you're seeing in this podcast, but mm-hmm. um, yeah. No, so, I, mean, I, I don't know if it's a mistake, I'm, but definitely something to, um, to, to think through a bit more, right? Especially in the terms of like ecological thinking, because I think there's been some urban uh, political ecologists that frame it. So as you framed urbanization as one of the fastest growing spaces, they'll frame it as a, you know, a really quickly emerging ecology, mm-hmm. uh, which is when I started reading that, my mind was like, Arr! again, because <laughs> it's been, it's been the way I think is structured along kind of these dichotomies, these ways of framing it as mm-hmm. this or that, um, these kind of stark boundaries between places. So let's switch a, a little bit now to to focusing on the, the concept for today. And you mentioned earlier that you're looking a bit at smart cities. And I, I know that this has come up a bit with technology as well. The idea of um, right to the city. Oh, before we start bringing in the the more than human aspects to this, could you possibly just tell me what does it mean? What is rights to the city? What are we talking about here? Sure. So kind of a caveat before we even get into it. Um, I am by far not a legal scholar. My background is not in, I mean, having said that, I, I do have a master's in animals and public policy. So I do have a little bit of a political background. I have taken political science classes. But whenever I come at this topic, I come at it from a sociology perspective. I come at it from what are our social relationships? What are, how, basically, how does the social influence how we then legalize our relationships? So mm-hmm. if, if we're talking legal, I'm sure there's, there are scholars out there who are much better at the legal aspect of it. I come at it from a sociology perspective. But having said that, I think if we're talking about rights to the city, I mean, there's, there is that theory, the right to the city theory um, that I based my paper on that looks at basically the right to the city is for anybody who is residing in and experiencing the city. So it's this idea of being able to actually engage not only with the physical entity of the city, but also to be able to access the resources you need to be able to thrive. Um, and that's a, that's kind of the universal expectation of that, I, that I'm building off of is that whether you're talking human or non-human, that's kind of where you have to start. So the physical access to space, being physically present or allowed to be present in the space, and the being, I guess, equipped with the ability to thrive. So not just to survive in the city, but to have your needs taken into consideration and and how that could possibly shape the space. Is that correct? Yes. 
Yeah. <laughs> okay. So so um so here we're we're saying it's it's how can we say that we as a particular group in a particular part of the city say that uh someone else as a maybe a, a potentially different group in potentially a different part of the city is determining how we live, but we want to take control over that, right? Exactly. So to to lay a claim to a right to the city is to say maybe we've been disenfranchised, our needs haven't been taken into consideration, and they should be. And uh, as opposed to a sense, it's to demand from your your political actors that something happen, uh, your political actors and your urban planners that your needs be taken into consideration, right? Yeah. Yeah, to a great extent, that is that's that is what the idea comes back to. Um, it's one. It's being able to claim your I'm trying to think of another word than right, but it is your claim to the city. In the ultimate sense mm-hmm. of the sense of the word, you are a resident in the city. Um, you should have just as many. It's just as much of an ability to access what the city has to offer as anybody else. Uh, So in your paper, you kind of frame right to the city in three questions, right? Who's right to the city, what right, and which city? So perhaps here we can actually start to bring bring, uh, animals in a little bit. Uh, Let's let's maybe look at these three questions as a way of moving forward. Uh, So in thinking about who's right to the city, what are we talking uh, about here? What are some of the key tenets of thinking through who has a right to the city? Sure. So this question is somewhat, what's the word I'm looking for? It's basically, it's, you can argue it a lot of different ways. So I, I start from the idea of anybody who is in the city has to have some level of that right to the access. Um, and that can get mm-hmm. complicated in terms of you argue, okay, so if if we're taking a snapshot of the city right now, does that mean anybody who is arriving tomorrow, um, anybody who is arriving in 10 years, they don't have that right? Or is it, it's, it's, you have to look at it as a more fluid sense, but it's this idea that when you have this space, you have this growing space and you have these limited resources in that space. Um, you have to be able to have everybody somehow engage with that. And so if you are looking mm-hmm. at the animal residents of it, you have to recognize, I think that's, that's where you come back to recognizing that there are actually urban animals. And um, we don't think of them. We, how do you think of a raccoon, for example, having... Um, access and rights to that access of resources. Um, So you have to think about um, how do you, how do you define the city and how do you identify who you consider a resident? So that's, that's, I think that first right uh, or that first question of who's right is you have to think about who you define as a resident. All right. So if we, if we were to think of raccoons as being, a, a, a residence in a city, uh, you know, raccoons often called trash pandas. Mm-hmm. They are, they, they have a very uh, clever way of operating in the shadows. Um, they've developed their own, I suppose, economy and way of working through the city and finding resources that work, uh, work for them. So if we were to think of raccoons as, uh, I mean, not think of, raccoons are in many cities. So we think of raccoons as being in the city. So they're there, they're in the city. And now we start to say, okay, like you said, what what rights do these raccoons have? Who gets to determine those rights? Right? Yeah. Um who gets to say who gets to say? Like uh, are the are the raccoons gonna go to the municipal council? So how do we then start to broach that question if we're thinking of the raccoon and trying to ask what they need? How do we begin to to even broach that question of saying, you know, or am I being too human centric in this? Am I saying, okay, how do humans help raccoons claim the city, or are raccoons actually reclaiming the city every time a trash can comes out that they figure out how to open? Yeah. Is that an act of reclamation? 
Yeah. So that's, that is definitely a key. I think that's a key argument that's being had in human animal studies. And there's a ton of different ways to approach it, I think. And so one of the ways that I was actually first introduced to it was um, Donaldson and Kimlicka's book, uh, Zoopolis, um, Mm -hmm. where they broke down this idea of how do we give rights or some kind of a political identity to different groups of animals. And so they actually broke down domestic animals got citizenship, like co-citizenship, and wild animals outside of the urban space would get uh, denizenship and... um, Oh my gosh, now I'm forgetting what the liminal animals got. They got, or no, liminal animals got denizenship. I switched it, sorry. And wild animals were sovereign. So they they have their own, they have their own territory. They have their own rights in that territory. Um, and then liminal animals, so that's where the raccoons would fit in. They get this kind of mixed, m- mixed legal status where they don't have quite as many so-called rights as a co-citizen would have. Um, but that is then balanced out by having a little bit more freedom to make their own decisions. And I think Mm -hmm. what at least some of the scholars I've read since that book came out, they say you get kind of, it gets kind of complicated because we come back to this question of who gets to decide how, first of all, what rights are included in, for example, citizenship or denizenship, but also how does that, how is that then, measured, I guess, is how they are actually engaging with that. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think one of the answers to that question comes in the form of multi-species ethnography. So actually, in our research and in our quest to actually answer these questions, to center these animals that we're interested in. And so uh, I don't know if you've read or heard of the book Among the Bone Eaters. It's uh, Marcus Baines Rock from Mm -hmm. 2015. He actually goes to Ethiopia and basically lives with um, the hyenas that come into that urban space in Harar. And he he obviously doesn't become a hyena, but he actually like sits down and thinks about how their interactions, how they interact with each other, but also how they interact with, say, the tourists that come to see them because they are they're not nearly as afraid of human beings as you would expect a wild animal to be. Mm -hmm. And so his book is really a a wonderful example of how do we actually try to not think like another animal. I'm not, I don't love that concept, but think in line with another animal. Yeah, empathize, Mm -hmm. but also just like try to view their world, their their way of uh, interacting with the world. Um, rather Mm -hmm. than trying to say, okay, well, we have all these, we understand the world from this particular perspective. Um, So how does that fit? How do they fit into our world? It's rather how, how do we fit into how do how can we fit into their conception of the world? And in that way, make it a more multi species experience. So that's Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's fascinating. It's fascinating, but it also poses, I guess, many challenges, right? So let's imagine a um, a hypothetical city here where we've got raccoons and we've got hyenas, and then we've also got you know a variety of animals that are in most cities: uh, pigeons, rats, cockroaches, and we've got all of these different animals, and they have their own claim to the space. Uh, they have their own claims and ways in which they use their space. Uh, so I guess then it becomes a difficult thing of trying to manage the expectations with those claims. Uh, are all these claims equal? I guess mm-hmm. not. What a, what a hyena needs from the urban space and expects from the urban space is potentially different, although maybe not that different from what a raccoon requires. Uh, I'm assuming there are uh, you know, a form of scavenging relationships, uh, a, a way in which, and I think this is the case for many urban animals, a, a kind of reliance on food systems, on mm-hmm. ecologies, urban ecologies. So what are their claims to urban space? And I think this is somewhat what comes up in in Will and Sue's book as well, is what is their claim to space as, as 
liminal animals as animals that use the urban setting to uh, to live and have a variety of social situations versus, let's say, uh, you know, dogs or cats who we've actively brought into the city, who as humans, we've decided you are here, you are staying here. Um, you know, what claim does a dog who's, or dogs who have been part of human spaces for 15,000 odd years, what claims do they have uh, to urban space? Should dog parks become something that are mandated and expected and yeah, it, but it becomes complicated. Yeah. Uh, so what if coyotes start killing dogs or dogs start killing coyotes? Mm -hmm. How is this, how is this navigated? Uh, have you thought through any of these sort of tensions between animals? Oh yeah. I mean, yes, that's definitely, that's definitely a piece that is very complicated. And I don't think anyone has quite like figured out that whole network and, and pulled out all those different knots. Um, but I think what I what I often come back to is I don't know how to exactly say this, but basically I feel a lot of times like humans have to somehow learn how to give up a little bit of control. And and that's it's hard. And this is probably why I'm so interested in the urban space, because for us, we feel like we have all of the control over the urban space. Mm -hmm. And in this way, we have to some say to an extent, we can't control everything. We can't define everything. So um, I love that you actually brought up the idea of dogs and dog parks, because that is one of those things where I always, I always want to stop and say, but wait, there's different types of dogs if we think about it. So there's, mm -hmm. there's the pet dogs. So we think about like, what do we do about dog parks and how do dog parks fit into the urban space? But then if you think about the, the types of dogs that I am interested in, and we also can get into the cats of that piece of it is many of these dogs, they interact with humans and they may be to an extent social with humans, but many of the dogs in, especially in cities in like India and Thailand, they have been living on the streets for generations um, so mm -hmm. there, there is still some influx of dogs from people abandoning their pets, um, of losing their pets, not purposefully abandoning them. Um, there are puppies born on the street for, from owned dogs that where the owners might not even know. Um, so there is still an influx being caused by human interaction, but there are many, many dogs who live freely on the streets and have themselves individual dogs never known that close of a mm. relationship with a human um so you dogs and cats in that way are a very interesting example because they complicate the situation even more um because you don't have yeah. it's not it's not like the raccoons where raccoons aren't domesticated in that way i mean you you have the odd example of people having raccoons as pets in that way but um, they as a species are still considered a wild animal. Um, but with dogs, it gets really complicated. Dogs and cats, it, get, it gets complicated because our level of responsibility um, for these different groups is also very different. Um, so I think... Mm. Yeah, I, yeah you, you point to a lot of really important uh, components there because... One, I think you're complicating the idea of having this whole conversation at the species level. So mm -hmm. I was giving, I think, quite fairly essentialized ideas, right? Yeah. Raccoons and hyenas and and possibly the hyenas and hurrah are very different to, uh, you know, hyenas found elsewhere. Oh, um, they are. There That's could be, really they, cool. Sorry. Yeah, and, and, and this is part of the reason why there's an interest in them because they're, they're stand out to some extent. So... There are different, I guess, cultural dimensions, right? You you can't just think of hyenas as being all equal. You can't think of raccoons as being exactly the same. Raccoons in different parts of the cities might have very different relationships with uh, the human residents in that city. Uh, and, and I like what you said there about dogs as well, because it complicates not only at the species level, but I guess across cities as well, uh, you know, in, in maybe talking about this claim or what rights do the city animals have, 
we draw on our own personalized experiences. What what are the dogs and cats around me? What do they do? What do they like to do? But then the icky question comes in of how much the dogs and cats in our lives how much what they like to do is shaped by human desires of what we want them to do, mm-hmm. the spaces we want them to have, uh, the extent to which a dog has to be on leash versus off leash. Uh, and yeah, the generational component. Surely these dogs in these cities, if they've been going for generations, they've got places where they go to eat. They've got boundaries of places they go or don't go. Mm-hmm. Um, and the claim of dogs in these different cities would likely be quite different, what they expect from the city and how city officials should respond. Exactly. And so that actually gets at um, the which it almost gets at the which city question. um, The last question that I address in the paper, um, because ultimately my argument is pretty much every city has to be thinking about these things, but it, you you kind of have different you have to think about it in, you have a systemic or a systematic way of looking at it but then you have to take that systematic way and fit it to that individual city so you're going to have you have cities that haven't even necessarily been created yet haven't been built yet um that will have to contend with this topic and i hope that any new cities that are going to be built will kind of address this topic from the beginning. Um, Mm -hmm. So that's kind of one idea. But then there's there's the rapidly growing cities, cities like in India, the ones that are building their smart city uh, network. Um, They will have to contend with it um, in a certain way. They have to think about how do we how do we build this technological system while also incorporating those voices that aren't being that aren't being heard at the moment. Um, Mm. But then you also have cities that might not be growing in the same way. And they're going to say, well, we're not growing. So why, so why do we have to change anything that we're doing? So I'm thinking of like the older Western European cities that are relatively, that are relatively developed and they are how they are. I mean, there's obviously always changes being made, but at their core, they might be like, well, we are what we are. We're not going to change that much. There's Mm. not, for example, they might not have as much space to work with, um, but they will then, if they're not making as big of changes, they're not overhauling the whole concept of their urban space. How do they then make small changes to better address the urban animals that live in their spaces? To to think about that, you know, already developed cities or cities that are somewhat more set in their ways making small, I I feel as though they could be pushed to also make more uh, comprehensive changes to some extent, Uh, you know, to not frame, there have been mass exoduses of animals pushed from these cities. So Mm -hmm. what, you know, people are talking about like rewilding um, wild spaces now, to what extent should cities be rewilded? And, And they're also, and that's an incorrect framing because they are, wild you know you would think of new york city as being a fairly stable established city but it's i think it's new york it's got one of the biggest hawk populations Mm -hmm. in the world and you just think okay no one thinks of a hawk population and new york city but things aren't as simple our imagination about where animals are is actually a bit off kilter right we've we've Mm -hmm. created this kind of external imaginary space where all the animals except dogs and cats are um but the minute you look at it a little bit more closely you see that there are predators in the city there are a variety of animals in the city and they're often operating either they're operating in the shadows the chances are they're operating in plain sight but we're just not looking we're just mm-hmm. not interested in seeing what they're doing and and that for me, I think, would be the starting point. I like that you say uh, individual cities need to think about what what they need and and who they should be thinking about in terms of humans and animals. And this is an important part, I think, of your thesis. Uh, the argument you make is you can't just talk about animals in this conversation. It's, yeah. it's kind of the relationship between them. Um, but yeah, it's it's I think. Of import, at first, it has to become something that people can even see as being important. 
before people are going to start making policies. And how do we do that? Like, how do we start to have humans view the urban as more than human, firstly? And secondly, view the other animals as a uh, as being worthwhile and as having a claim to the space. Ooh, Come on, change a... the world. Tell me how we do it. <laughs> no, <laughs> right now. A quick sound bite. And how we fix the world? Yeah, I mean, I think I think this is gonna. I don't know. This is this is almost a cop out, but it's like anything else. You have to attack it from all different perspectives. So I'm trying to do the work of doing the academic side of it. I'm trying to bring the theory, the the thought experiments, the like, let's think bigger um, argument. And then, but mm -hmm. there, it also has to come from, I think one, not once, like you can, you can do it in any order, but like, if you have the theoretical background, if you have, if you have the studies to prove that um, animals have a claim to the space. So all these multi, there's a, there's, kind of a a growing interest in this multi-species ethnography approach where you actually go out and say, hey, look, there's there's a hyena, there's a raccoon, there's somebody there. I want to interact with them and see what their experience of the city is. Um, as you're building up mm -hmm. these experiences, you have a basis for saying, hey, we're not we're not completely nutty for saying this. Like we have we have this proof, we have these stories to go off of. Um, but then it, it also comes down to animal welfare organizations to themselves break out of this categorization pump that they're in, where, where if you look at animal organizations, they, they often use these same categorizations of domestic animal, wild animal. They might add in like agricultural farm animal as an alternative, as a third category, um, if they talk about these liminal animals, they might say like feral cats or something like that. They, but they tend to still mm. lump like raccoons into wildlife writ large. Um, they don't, they don't break it out and say mm. there are very different interactions, very different experiences within this category. Um, so I think it's, it's just as much on them to kind of recognize this shift in understanding and the shift in categorization because they much more than a lot of academics are going to have access to the quote unquote average person um, who is experiencing the urban space and mm -hmm. who, who is going to be possibly interacting with, or is currently also interacting with these urban animals. Um, and then it comes down to actually taking these, these challenges of the categorizations and putting them into legal language and putting them into the policies and how we, mm -hmm. how we interact with um, animals in a legal sense. So, I mean, just like everything else, it takes, it takes all these different groups of people to say, okay, hold on, let's, let's reevaluate, let's rethink what yeah. we're doing. Yeah. I don't think that's, I don't think that's a cop out at all. Um, I think I would probably be a bit more skeptical if you were like, this is the one answer to everything. Um, because I will do it, it is, all. <laughs> exactly. Here yeah, I've uh, sat, I've you know, I've been working on this for a little time now, and I think I've got it. I think I would be a little bit more skeptical because I think with any sort of social movement, with any sort of change, it requires some thoughts and it requires some discomfort uh, and 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 things will eventually not things will eventually, things are changing. And sometimes we don't see change as it's happening. And sometimes it's not, not sometimes, oftentimes it's not this like linear progression of things. You, you're you moving in all sorts of directions. But I do think a critical part of this matrix, as you said there, is the, the hard work of thinking about this, kind of the work that you're doing and the work that scholars who are thinking through animals in the urban are doing is really thinking about applying some considered thought to the variety of worlds, the variety of life experiences, um, you know, both philosophically, but also through, you know, cognitive ethology, um, ethnography, how, how can we, yeah, how can we think about this in a more complicated way? And something I love uh, what you said in your paper is, to some extent, I don't think we will ever get away from kind of categorizations. I think it's to some, it's, it's how we find patterns. I think humans are 
uh, pattern finding animals. Uh, and to some extent, our language has almost always been centered around some forms of categorizations. But something you say in your paper, and it's always said a bit uncomfortably with me, um, is the softening of the divides, kind of the blurring of the edges that we could construe of, I'm South African, uh, you know, someone else is Canadian, but there are also, those are categories, but there are also blurry lines between those categories. What does it mean to be a South African, right? Are all South Africans the same? Uh, same thing as what does it mean to be an urban dog? Are all urban dogs the same? Um, so I really loved that. I think you you drove home language in a, in a beautiful way in terms of thinking about how we can claim a city uh, and how animals can claim a city. Yeah. So we're approaching, if you can believe it, I told you the time would go quickly. Um, <laughs> Once you get started, you just, everybody just talks right? and talks and talks. Because <laughs> it's fascinating stuff. And, and once you have that crack open, I think, in your thinking about the world and your space being more than human, you start to just see it more. You see the ants mm -hmm. crawling up the wall. You see the squirrels running on the, the cables. You see nests and food being supplied and all sorts of interactions. You think, oh, wow, that's, that's interesting and that's fascinating and potentially sad or liberating and exciting. I have a lot of ambivalent feelings. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the key. I think that's the key of opening this door and saying, okay, I'm going to have a lot of complicated feelings about this and I have to sit with it. I have to think about how does this make me feel and why does it make me feel like that? Because we have we have this long history of these social interactions that kind of explain, tell us how to experience the world. Um, and we have to, we have to back up and say, okay, maybe not, maybe this isn't like, We've been taught this for mm. generations, but maybe it's not the right thing to think about. And I think mm. um, not to get off on some another topic that is not at all related to this, but I mean, this is these are the conversations we're having in a lot of different settings. It's conversations we're having about our interactions with people that we see as different. I mean, I'm obviously in the U.S. and I mean, the Black Lives Matter movement, it's conversation that we should, and that has been going on for a long time, but hasn't gotten the traction that it should have gotten for years. And so mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's all these conversations that we are having. And, and everyone always says, um, when we have these uncomfortable conversations, you have to sit with these uncomfortable feelings. And I think that's where we mm -hmm. ultimately get back to, um, is sitting down and saying, okay, doesn't quite make sense, but somehow, somehow we have to sit with it and think about it. No, I think I think you make a you make a lot of good points there, and I'm happy you brought up the Black Lives Matter movement because this does speak to, you know, laying claim to a city, uh, saying, you know, what do we expect from our city? What do we expect from our police officers? Who gets to move about in a city in a way that is undisturbed versus in a way that is violent? Uh, whose lives matter in this space and how? Right, and then I think, in many regards, this is. This is at the core of, you know, rights to the city or claims to the city is saying we deserve to be here and we deserve to feel safe in this space. Yeah. Um, and like you said, this is happening in a variety of, of areas, right? You've got um, groups, activist groups that are working actively against showing how claims to the city have been racialized. You've got groups that are saying, showing how claims to the city have been mitigated or um, or further divided through access to technology, right? Mm -hmm. Claims to the city saying, hey, how can half the city have access to the internet and the other half don't, and this is a smart city or it's not? Um, who has access to what technology? Where are the cell phone towers? Where are the wires that give us our internet? Because these have very material consequences for those humans, right? What jobs can you get? How connected can you be? And similarly with with animals, and and something that we've perhaps not spoken about yet though is with with the Black Lives Matter movement, with a call for you know claims to a digital, a more digital equality in cities, is activism. So we spoke here about uh, the need for academic work, uh, welfare organisations being 
you know, more critical of themselves, but also the work of activists and how important I think activism is in reclaiming a space, in disturbing the space, in making yeah. the space uncomfortable. Yeah. Mm. Do you know of any any organizations that are doing this um, type of work? Specific to the city, I actually don't, but there's there is a group um and i'm going to forget the name of it now but there is a specifically non-human rights group that is doing a lot of really cool work with basically taking individual cases legal cases um to the courts to say this this particular non-human this this i they mm. seem to focus a lot on elephants this elephant has these certain rights um like I said, mm. I'm going to forget the name of the group now, um, but I can maybe. I think, I think a lot of there are a lot of activist legal activist groups that are doing quite a bit of. Uh, I know Animal Justice released that expose last last year um, for Farm in Canada, and they're bringing up a lot of legal cases that challenge some mm -hmm. of the categories and legal ways in which we categorize, um, you know, such as using the idea of personhood, etc. Another activist group that I think really bothers the urban space to some extent is Anonymous for the Voiceless. They they take up entire urban squares, right? They mm -hmm. put masks on. They have a video showing, uh, and there's something interesting. There's something interesting in that from an urban perspective because they are claiming they're claiming space, an urban public space, right? They're standing generally in really busy squares, places where people are not trying to think about how we're connected to animals outside of us. And yet they're also bringing our food systems into the heart of the city. You know, animals are not, oftentimes in urban, um, North American urban cities, animals are not killed within the city and they're not allowed to be killed within the city. And uh, I think groups like Anonymous for the Voiceless kind of show how the city is connected to other systems, other places, uh, and they claim that space in a way that's oftentimes uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So I think I think people like you and I, who are scholars thinking about these things, are important uh, for generating new conceptual ways of even grappling with this. But we have to also, you know, tip our hats off to organizations that make these spaces uncomfortable too. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, it's actually interesting, the the agriculture piece of it, because um, that is something that people don't necessarily think about with the, with the growth of cities. Um, for a long time, agriculture was very much a part of city life because we didn't have the preservation of food. Like we couldn't preserve it for a long time. We couldn't, if we transported it, transportation was relatively slow. And so you couldn't have your farm be way out there somewhere and then bring the food into the city because it would go bad mm. before it got into the city. So they would have, yeah. they had to have these like very open transportation routes between the city and um, a farm that was basically right on the edge so that they could get the food into the city because cities, people would live and die for that food that was brought in. Um, and it was only with the industrial age that it got shifted to such a such to make it so separate mm -hmm. because they then had, they figured out how to preserve food. Yeah. They had much better transportation that got it there faster. So they were able to say, okay, now city here, mm -hmm. agriculture there. Um, so yeah. So yeah, we forget mm -hmm. how linked agriculture and city growth is. Um, so I think that's really important to, to be able to bring those two pieces back together. Yeah both in terms of consumption and, like you're saying here, conceptualization, even how we just conceive of the city as being a human space has been largely born of the, the expulsion of certain animals from, from the city. Um, okay, before we speak forever, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's, that's how I end every episode. Like, I could talk to you forever. I think I might just have a talking too much problem. Um, <laughs> that's okay. Do you have a... Yeah, it was something that was in every school report of mine. Claudia is <laughs> Claudia's a lovely student, but she talks too much in class. <laughs> if only those teachers could see me now. Um, okay, we like to end off the show uh, with a quote and then a brief discussion about that quote, uh, something that ties in either the theme of the season or uh, today's concept. Uh, do you have a, a quote ready? I do. I have two. Both of them are like a sentence or less, um, but they – they kind of are the two quotes that have 
that really like catapulted me into exactly how I try to approach and think about things. So they're both from Indian scholars. Uh, the first is from Narayanan, um, from an article from 2017, where she actually quoted a volunteer working with Indian nonprofits feeding street dogs. And the volunteer said, we, speaking of humans, need to be sensitized to the fact that we are not the only animals with an, opi an opinion on the environment. And specifically, they were talking, obviously, about the urban environment and talking about how one struggle that they had in this nonprofit was the volunteers would be putting food out for the street dogs, but they weren't thinking about that dogs have territories. And so they would put the, the food either mm -hmm. right on like a territorial boundary or just in one territory versus another. And they were actually creating aggressive situations between dogs because the dogs would be the dogs on in one territory would say, well, there's food right there. I'm going to go get it really quickly. But then the dogs from the other territory were like, excuse mm -hmm. me, what? Like, this is my territory. Um, so they weren't thinking about that. And so like, it's a very short quote, but it's, it really helps me to remember we, it's our responsibility to take on this work of rethinking how we view the environment, yeah. but also how other animals view the environment. Yeah. Um, it, it, it cuts to the heart of many, uh, much of what we've said today, but I think it also links back to season two in some respects where we spoke about uh, animals and experience, that it's not enough as scholars to just kind of think of animals as these objects that move about in space, but that their experiences and the ways in which they experience the world need to be taken into consideration because they're not necessarily the same as ours mm -hmm. and how and what they value is not the same and it's not uniform across species or within species so I think that's a really powerful quote in in you know one in just saying like telling humans to have a bit of humility uh, and two in in yeah like you say just being a little bit more aware of how others experience the world and that's not just for other animals it's for other humans too just yeah yeah, it's really, really uh, powerful, I think. What's the, the second quote you have ready? The second quote is from um, her name. Her last name is Srinivasan. This is from 2012. And she's talking about Indian street dogs' legal status as compared to stray dogs in the UK. So what I liked about these two quotes is the first one actually addresses the idea of urban animals generally. And this one gets more at the like, the legal rights aspect of it. So it, it kind of touches on both of these themes that we've been talking about. But so in talking about it, she says they, speaking of Indian street dogs, are not always already defined as human property and therefore restricted to living in the predetermined roles of human pets or working animals or exper experimental objects in laboratories. Dogs in India can be in the absence of a human owner. Um, and she emphasizes the word be. So it, it really, this was... When I read this quote the first time, I was like, ta-da, like, here it is. This is, this is what I, this is my whole, like, what I want to do. And it, it just recognizes that we don't have to have a, like, really close personal relationship and especially not a controlling relationship with these other animals. They, mm -hmm. they are entities, they are beings all their own and they, and we have to really take that into consideration we really have to respect that and like move from that perspective rather than well they're property well they they're in my space they're whatever it is like you have to you have to recognize them as beings of their own volition first and foremost and then mm. bring that into how does that affect the relationships we have with them yeah actually i got goosebumps as you said it at the end there because it is you know, like the minute you start to imagine animal worlds where hu and humans unfortunately have kind of touched most animal worlds, but imagine the relationships that are forging without any human intervention to just decenter the human a little bit and think about think about the fact that there are thousands and millions of relationships going on where we are not the priority in them, right? Yeah. like we are we are the background noise to uh, whatever those relationships are. So I really, yeah, I, I really love that. And I, and I appreciate that you brought property back into this because while we didn't speak about it much in this episode, it, it came up a lot in season one because until the idea of animals being things that are owned, 
versus, and this goes for any animal, right? A wild animal, domesticated animal, they are, they are not autonomous agents. And I don't know the correct words for this in terms of philosophy or, or law, but they're not viewed as themselves. They are something to be owned instead of someone who is living a life. Um, and yeah, you're kind of just bringing the geography into more focus and saying that the urban is a space that really needs this consideration too. Yeah. Yeah. So important. Thank you so much. So before we we wrap up, could you possibly tell me a little bit about what you're currently working on and if folks are interested in what you're doing, how they could get in touch with you? Sure. So I am actually trying to finish my dissertation. Thanks to COVID, my plans went like way out the window. I was actually supposed to be in India this last year doing multi-species ethnography in Pune. I was actually in India in March last year when the world shut down. So I had to <laughs> really fast fly back to the US. But I am now doing it. Um, I'm, I'm restarting that project, um, looking at specifically the experiences of slum residents and street dogs in Pune, India, and what those experiences can tell us exactly about this question of the urban space, who has access, who has power, how do you what what does an equitable city look like for these different residents and how do we take those understandings and implement them better in um, the urban social world, the urban political world, any of that. So that's what I'm working on now. Um, I'm focusing mostly on interviews with um, the slum residents themselves and also street dog feeders, people who are actively engaged in working with assisting um, feeding all the street dogs that are in Pune. Um, and they also do a lot of education, which is really cool. If people mm -hmm. want to get in touch with me, if they want to see the work I'm doing, I, I do need to create my own, um, website and maybe actually think about social media a little bit more, but right now the best way probably is just, the, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not the best with social media or any of that. I, I'm, yeah, I, but the best way to get a hold of me is over the sociology website for uh, Michigan State University, which is where I'm doing my PhD. So it's just uh, sociology.msu.edu. Um, and then you can find me under the people tab under graduate students. Awesome. It's a great website. I was uh, on there this morning. Um, what a cool program. A lot of like, it's nice to see a concentration of folks that are looking at animal studies uh, questions you know, it seems like a, a a group that is really thinking through some of these hard questions that we've been speaking about here today. Yeah. So best of luck in your writing. Uh, I know firsthand that writing a thesis is hard and, <laughs> um, and COVID complicates it a little bit more. So thank you so much for the work you're doing and best of luck in continuing to think through these questions. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for being here with me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Welcome to the Animal Highlight, everyone. This is the first one. I'm going to give it a go as a new kind of segment of the Animal Turn podcast. And the goal is to just kind of highlight and flag some awesome animal stories. It might be an anecdote. It might be some research. Uh, it might be something that's in the news. Uh, but it's just a way of trying to actually shine a spotlight on a specific group of animals or a specific individual even. And in today's highlight, the first highlight, I thought I would share a, a clip from a documentary that that actually blew my mind. I think it was one of the first clips I saw that kind of opened the veil to me about thinking about animals in a more complicated way, uh, thinking about how they plan and just, I think, sitting with my amazement a little bit. First, I watched a 2011 TED talk by a gentleman named Joshua Klein called The Amazing Intelligence of Crows. There was a small clip in his talk that he shared uh, of David Attenborough presenting for the BBC Wildlife documentary of crows in a Japanese city who were flying, you know, and dropping these really big nuts, but they weren't cracking when they dropped them. Uh, so they s switched strategies and started to sit on, you know, traffic light poles and drop their nuts into the street so that cars would drive open the, over the nuts, crack them open, and voila, the birds can eat the nuts. Now that's already a pretty, like it's amazing. It's, it's, it's thinking about a plan, it's executing the plan. But then it gets perfected even more. 
These birds realize that if they just fly down from right there, they run the risk of getting run over by a car. So what they start to do is they start to drop the nuts, not on any street, not just in any place, but near pedestrian crossings, near traffic lights, where cars will from time to time be made to stop. So the birds drop the nuts in the street, the nuts crack, and then they wait patiently on the side of the road until the cars stop. They hop into the road and they eat their nuts. And this for me just blew my mind. At the time I was flabbergasted and I remain flabbergasted. And I think so much interesting work is coming out right now about crows and also just incredible experiments being done with crows and magpies that show them solving all sorts of really complicated problems. Everything from having, you know, a nut or something at the bottom of a jar in water and realizing that if they put stones in that water, the water level rises so they can get their nut. And it seems simple, but it's not. It's really, really complicated. I'm not too sure I would have figured out the solution to that, to be honest. So there you have it. The highlight for today is crows slash somewhat magpies. Uh, and if you're interested in learning more about crows and magpies, I've put together a couple of uh, neat little videos on our YouTube channel. Yes, the Animal Turn has a YouTube channel uh, with just, you know, just little videos showing some of the amazing things they do. Some of them are kind of funny. Many of them are really informative. But head over there to the Animal Turn podcast on YouTube and uh, there's a playlist there called Animal Highlights. If you've got any ideas for animals that could be highlighted in the segment, feel free to reach out to me, info at the Animal Turn Podcast.com. That's it, everybody. I just want to say thank you once again to Marie for being a wonderful guest. Thank you to, again to Animals and Philosophy, Politics, Law and Ethics, Apple, for sponsoring this podcast, to Jeremy John for the logo, and to Gordon Clark for the bed music. This is The Animal Turn with me, Claudia Hertenfelder. For more great iRaw podcasts, visit iRawPod.com. That's I-R-O-A-R-P-O-D.com. Ah!